Rosie's sleepless night in Take the High Road. Only Bucky Street, say magnifique, Bucky Street, magnifique, Bucky Street, Bucky Street, Bucky Street, Liverpool's mission is to pull back the 2 0 lead Genoa have after the first leg in Italy. The prize, a UEFA Cup semi-final place. The time, next Wednesday at 7, live on one. And now let's see what you think of us as we join Anne Robinson for more points of view. and it's nice to be back. Points of View was knocked off its perch last Wednesday because of football, as were a great many other programmes. In fact, whichever way you twisted and turned last Wednesday between 7 and 9.30, you pretty well ended up with blokes kicking a ball. Liverpool versus Genoa on BBC One, Spurs versus Feyenoord on ITV. Football, football and more football. Not only for two and a half hours, but at peak viewing time and on both main channels. Most of my work colleagues and our families were all disgusted at the way this one sport took over our television sets for the best part of an evening. Says G.H. Freeman, or maybe J. Abraham, if not K. Bennett, three of the 16 signatures on that letter from India Buildings in Liverpool. Mrs. E. Anderson in Colchester thinks it's about time the programme schedulers did a poll to see how many people actually want to watch football, which she sums up as... Hugging, mugging, kicking, action replays and lots of waffle by the commentators. And you can't say fairer than that unless you are a motor racing fan in which case your irritation probably reached maximum revs during sports night the Wednesday before last. Those roars of disapproval becoming thunderous by midnight when the debonair Desmond explained there would be no vom vomming because of the feast of goals. But says a... Truly disgruntled. NG Rose of Bury St Edmunds. The results of these matches were known before sports night went on air. So why couldn't you announce your decision to reschedule at 10 o'clock? And Anthony Harvey of Islington sound up everyone's frustration in a sharp and very direct phone call. I didn't want to watch football, I wanted Formula One. You just don't realise or don't care about the inconvenience you cause viewers by your sloppy programme information. And again, Mr H. You just don't realise or don't care about the inconvenience you cause viewers by your sloppy programme information. I don't expect to be conned into watching programmes that don't appear. I do expect to know about cancelled plans immediately. At present, your policies are causing intense irritation to what would otherwise be faithful viewers. And I'm glad I'm not his secretary. And if we lingered on Trekkie letters, dismayed and distraught as they are, that the Winter Olympics push their favourite viewing to one side, we'd be here all night. But whatever scheduling and sport have done to incur your wrath, drama have more than made up for. A bumper time, huge cries of delight coming from various directions. One can only hope you did not miss, truly, madly, deeply, the poignant screen to award-winning film starring Juliet Stevenson, who to her delight finds that her dead lover, played by the delicious Alan Rickman, has obligingly returned when he sees how hopelessly she's coping without him. Jane. Sun ain't gonna shine anymore. The moon ain't gonna rise in the skies. The tears are always clouding your eyes. When you're with us. And a viewer from Granborough near Rugby in Warwickshire was so overcome, she, I'm sure it was a she, forgot to sign her name. But the message is clear. Truly wonderful, madly addictive, deeply emotional. What more can I say except superb? More of the same appreciative coups to mark the end of Love Hurts, that ten-parter. Hasn't time flown since Christmas? Starring Adam Faith and Zoe Wanamaker, a couple of misfits, he a millionaire plumber, her a city slicker with a conscience, who fall in love, she finally goes off on a trip to Africa, he finally goes broke, and she tells him it's over. Congratulations to all on Love Hurts. I think it's bliss. I'm dreading it finishing. Who wants to watch Adam Faith, I thought? Well, I do. He's quite wonderful. Yes, mostly women have written to say how much they enjoyed the series. You found it funny, painful, real. Well, sometimes real. Not only does love hurt, but so does the scenery. I was born in Grimsby, and yet I recognise none of where Tessa came from. Grimsby Town Railway Station had mysteriously sprouted grassy banks, and there were the loud cries of seagulls. 
In fact, in Grimsby, the seagulls don't bother to wheel over the railway station when they have the fish docks. And those pebbles on the beach and lots of blue English channel-type water. I know, Barbara Dent, I know. And I bet people in Worthing were saying, my goodness, doesn't Grimsby look just like round here? Low budget. Meanwhile, over in Fintock in Oxfordshire, Bookmark combined fact and fiction to recreate a day in the life of the much underrated and understated novelist Barbara Pym, whose wry observations and gentle wit were such a delight. Here, a little bit set in 1977. What did you think of the sermon? I never knew the vicar had so much poetry in him. <laughs> Still, it's an odd fish. And who is the lady? Oh, she's a widow. Dangerous creatures, widows. Hmm. They seem to have the knack of catching a man. <laughs> Having done it once, they can always do it again. I suppose there's nothing to it when you know how. It's like mending a fuse. <laughs> Maxine Evans of Well and Garden City described the programme as a captivating snapshot of a day in her life skillfully portrayed by Patricia Routledge, who carried the audience gently through the thoughts and observations of this truly English novelist. I thoroughly enjoyed this unusual representation from my position as one unfamiliar with Barbara Pym's work. Now, very briefly, we'll rewind to a Wogan a few weeks past when Gloria Honeyford was in the chair and Mr Salman Rushdie was one of her guests. An unusually large post bag on this, much indignation at the way Mr Rushdie was interviewed and, interestingly, a great many letters from viewers who claim that until that evening they'd had no particular sympathy for Mr Rushdie's case. Don't let's fall into the trap again of believing that persecution is somehow justified because it's got religion behind but it. But don't you take any of the responsibility, the fact that I you take, wrote it in the first place? I take the responsibility for writing a book. The act of writing a book is a serious act. I do not take the responsibility for my own murder. No, I don't. Well, well I let me ask you something else. Hmm. Will you publish the paperback? I will certainly publish the paperback. But then yes. you're reiterating the whole thing no, all over again. No, look, let me put it the other way. Do you think that it is right that a terrorist threat from a foreign state should determine what we can say and think and publish in this country. And a very, very brief selection of your comments. With Gloria Honeyford around Salman, who needs fatwa? And? Although I wouldn't have expected Miss Honeyford to have made an active stand against the fatwa, I certainly didn't expect a line of questioning which could have come from the Iranian government itself. Also, Gloria Honeyford seemed bent on misunderstanding what Mr Rushdie was so clearly saying and unable to comprehend the moral issue involved. But this was no reason to conduct the interview in such an unfriendly fashion. And a sum up. What a tangy spat. And that's all we've time for. Oh, go on then. We started with sport upsetting everybody and we didn't allow a Trekkie to speak. Don't get us wrong. We've got nothing against sport. Nothing against football, the Olympics, darts, snooker. But however nice the track suits, the tennis skirts, the waistcoats, they're not quite as much fun as the crew of the Enterprise. And none of them play with ray guns or walkie-talkie badges. And while we're on the subject of no, Star Trek... No, enough. I'll leave you with a little bit of cliff for the oldies and a little bit of wet, wet, wet... Wet? Well, there are four for the boppers. I'll be back in a fortnight. Oh, and for those who've written to ask, and as today is no smoking day, yes, I'm still stopped from this time two years ago. Good night. Oh, in your wishing well, your hopes inside it, and take your love and promises and make them last. Whoa, oh, you make them last. Yeah. Caught up in your wishing well, your hopes inside it Take your love and promises And make them last BBC Two's film in a couple of minutes offers the chance to meet a dim-witted young man with a genius for inventing mechanical gadgets. Even James Bond would be impressed by the talents of Malcolm, the hero of this Australian comedy. When Chris Brotherton was diagnosed as terminally ill, the family decided to share their experiences with QED. You feel very, very sorry about leaving other people. In fact, they feel much worse than you do. I think that we should just take each day as it comes and see what happens that day. And make sure you need to put a smile on your face. Do you love it? <laughs> QED, tonight at the new time of 10 o'clock. In a moment, we've an extended nine o'clock news, which means that QED will be starting later than scheduled, as will programmes for the rest of this evening. The budget response will now be at 9.50, and at 10.55, we've a film based on a true story about a young woman's legal battle in Texas to have an abortion, Roe versus Wade. 
Second Chance is at half past midnight, and then to round off the evening at 12.45, we've highlights of the 1992 National Hunt Festival.